Hey you and welcome, my name is Mike and in this whole video I have for you three stories all set in national parks and all equally as baffling and dark. The first story is about a boy who went missing and he was later found in unexplainable and also horrifying circumstances so look forward to that. Then we have a fire watcher who one night heard a knock knock knocking on her door. She opened it only to be devoured, I think is the only way to put it, devoured by the forest. And then we have a horse riding trip through Yosemite, which takes a gut-wrenching turn. Put that in your pipe and smoke it, or don't. I love hiking and I love national parks, which is why each of these stories has kind of like been on my mind for a bit. But before we get into it, please subscribe if stories for the dark are your thing like they are my thing. Now, let's give it a go. It was in 1999, so they're the 90s, they're always like creepier, when a group was setting out for a hike, as we all do. This was in October of 1999, you know, the weather starting to cool, the leaves turning crisp, high up in the Rockies, the Arapaho and Roosevelt National Forest. This is right in the middle of the Rocky Mountains, a popular, a popular forest. Everybody I've ever met from Denver goes on and on about the nature and the trails and the hiking and the yada yada yada. So this would probably be part of that. It's pretty close, it's only about two hours from like downtown in the city. Heading out that day for a hike were 11 adults and two children heading up into the trails. Almost all were members of the Christian Singles Network based out of Denver. If you can believe it, they were shockingly Christians who were single looking to mingle. There were over 30 of them in the group in the park this very day, but only about 11 of those 30 were actually heading off on the hike. The rest were back at the resort where they were staying for the weekend. This was the Poudre River Resort. It's a place along the Poudre in the Poudre River Valley. There's cabins there, about 10 of them, a store, campsites along the river, RVs, you know, a place to base yourself before heading out into the wild. And get this, the owner of the Poudre River Resort was also a member of the Christian Singles Network. So as you can imagine, the entire group, they would all be very welcome there. They would head up to the Poudre River Valley to go hiking for retreats, for barbecues, and to meet other single Christians in their area. The owner of the resort, he also worked as a teacher and he owned the place uh, with his twin brother. His name was Alan Atadero. See, Alan had been married to a woman named Stacy and they had two kids together, six-year-old Jocelyn and three-year-old Jared. As you probably guessed, Alan was now divorced, hence the Christian Singles Network, and he was raising the two kids by himself. So he was raising these two young children by himself. He also ran this resort. He worked as a physical education teacher in a local uh, junior high school. And then he was also looking for love. Busy man. And Alan Atadero was somebody who found great, great comfort in his faith. It was something that was extremely important to him and to raising his two young children. So, you know, if you wanted to meet somebody new, the faith would also have to be equally as important to them. So that early October, you know, not quite a chill in the air, but you know, you could see it from here. This area would be in a matter of weeks, be blanketed with heavy snow. This was the group's last retreat for the summer. They'd come for the weekend. So that October 2nd, early on in the day, 11 members of the Christian Singles Network, they wanted to head down the road to a state fish hatchery. Wanted to head down, have a goo, it was only like two miles down the road. And Alan's two young children, just Alan and Jared, they they wanted to go with the group. They wanted to head down. Now, young six-year-old just Alan, she was, she knew one of the people pretty well who's in the group. So Alan was like, fine, you know, she can head off with them. But then next thing you know, three-year-old Jared comes up and he wants to go with his big sister, as you can imagine. Alan was not really too happy about young Jared going off with them. He had, it was his three-year-old baby son. He had never, like, let him out of his sight before in his life. So he was kind of, eh, maybe you shouldn't go, but then he eventually relented. After all, it's only two miles down the road. They'll have a look at the hatchery, and they'll be back. He knew the group. He knew everybody who was there. Be grand. So Alan stayed at the resort, and he was, you know, doing his thing around the resort, looking after his guests, and starting to pack up stuff for the coming winter, while the 11 adults from the Christian Singles Network and the two children went down the road to, to the hatchery. But what Alan didn't know was that while they were down there, the plan sort of changed. 
Now, before we continue, let me take a second to tell you about this old video's sponsor, Grammarly. You know, doing the research and writing for these stories, it takes a hell of a long time, as you can probably imagine, but you know what helps me save some of that time? You guessed it, Grammarly. I've been using it for a hell of a long time now at this point. I think I've probably over 500 videos. Wow. On this channel at this point. So if I wasn't using a tool to help me write faster, snap your scripts, um, well, there wouldn't be that many videos, let me tell you. Grammarly not only helps with spelling and grammar, though, they have an AI writing partner that helps any professional like me get their work done faster and more effectively. If you're not aware, their AI features are free, F-R-E-E, -E, so I'm not really kind of too sure what you're waiting for. However, upgrading to premium it has been a game changer, folks, let me tell you. With Grammarly Premium, you can get the power of AI to help you write the bestest thing Everest. Yeah, Grammarly told me uh, not to say that, but you know, come on, it's me. Grammarly Premium not only works with you to craft quality writing faster, it also has premium tone suggestions, so you never sound either too friendly nor too formal. What the situation calls for, it'll help you. I often have to send these emails to businesses, sponsors, all of that. So what I do then is write an email out, then I get Grammarly to change the tone of the entire email that I just wrote. So it sounds way more professional with just a couple of clicks. Let's be frank, you know me, it makes me sound less dumb. And with their feature, App Actions, it keeps all your work in one place without the need to switch around and search for documents and writing tips, streamlining everything so you can focus on getting those words out. For example, you can easily link a file from Google Drive or schedule a call through Calendly. For me personally, it helps me write better, more dynamic scripts, and also I love how it helps me craft, you know, eat titles for videos and the inspiration it gives me. They're pretty solid. People are talking a lot about AI these days, but Grammarly uses it in one of the coolest ways possible. It helps you, it streamlines things, it improves the quality of the work you are doing. So you can just get the work done faster and enjoy taking some time. You rest those dogs, watch some TV, take your time, take, take a rest. So if this sounds like the kind of thing you would be interested in, and if you are writing a lot for work, for pleasure, whatever it is, I couldn't more highly recommend it. Please click the link down below. Sign up to try their AI features for free. And when you're ready, use my link, grammarly.com slash that chapter to get 20% off Grammarly Premium, which gives you the very best tools you need to craft the very best quality writing. Once again, that is grammarly.com slash that chapter to get 20% off Grammarly Premium. Thank you so much to Grammarly for sponsoring that chapter. Now let's get a hell of back to the story. It was a beautiful day. Alan would say it was a gorgeous fall bluebird day in the mountains, not a cloud in sight. Summer digging in its last fingernails before the fall. So after reaching the fishery, a few of the adults, they didn't want to stop. They didn't want to just head back to the resort after that. They wanted to keep going. They wanted to go hiking further along the trails into the woods. The day is only gorgeous, Squad. Sure, let's enjoy the outdoors while we're here. May as well make the most of it. We won't be doing another retreat till springtime. So they popped in their vehicles and they drove up the mountains, these little twisting tiny little roads that, that went through this incredibly mountainous, densely forested area. And eventually they came across a trail that they said, hey, this looks good, doesn't look like anything too difficult, looks like a nice walk in the woods. That was called Big South Trail. But that was actually 16 miles on from the hatchery, the fish hatchery. So it was 18 miles on from the Poudre Resort. So Alan was thinking they were only two miles away, when in reality, they were much, much further into the woods, in a much more remote, you know, the kind of place where people would still sacrifice to Bigfoot if there was people who even were around in this area. There was only Bigfoot in this neck of the woods. So as I said, Alan was back at the resort, getting stuff ready, looking after his guests, pottering around doing this and that, winterizing his equipment, and he didn't even realize that they should have been back by now. He was so busy, he actually lost track of time. It was then as he was popping around and into the back of the store that they ran out of a resort where they would sell, you know, camping equipment and cliff bars or whatever. He was in the back of the store just kind of packing things away and he heard some commotion coming from outside. He was thinking, here we go. Something's gone wrong in the resort. There's been an incident or something's broke or whatever. So he kind of pops his head out, see what can he do? What does he have to do now? When in walks the manager and two women. He could hear that they had been talking loudly and worriedly, so here comes bad news. Now, the two women who came in had actually been on the hike that day, and they had returned from the hike. They had been the only two who had come back. They said to him, hey, Alan, we have to tell you something. You need to sit down. Something happened to Jared. His stomach then drops, and then he's thinking, great, what now? You know, did he fall? Is he injured? Is he okay? 
Their answer to all of that was, we don't know. We can't find him. And then, you know, what do you mean you can't find him? You're only a couple of miles down the road at the fish hatchery. It's not like there's many places to go. Then it was revealed, oh no. They actually went a lot further into those woods than just down to the road. They were 18 miles away. The entire group then jumps into their vehicles and books it to Big South Trail. And Alan is there, he's screaming, he's pounding his chest, he's roaring his, heads off, his head off. They arrive at the Big South Trail where, you know, Jared had, had been. Alan jumps out and he runs into the trail screaming his name. Search and rescue had been called by this time to let them know that there was a missing three-year-old boy on that mountain. What happened that day is when they reached Big South Trail, 11 adults and the, the two young children, they started walking along the trail and the group kind of just divided naturally, uh, but into these two separate groups. There was the slow group, as you can imagine, and then the fast group, the people who were walking faster. Jared, at the start, he was walking with the slow group, but eventually he le left them, caught up with the faster group who were a little bit ahead, and he actually just kept going. He kept walking ahead of even the faster group. One of the group even said, hey, you know, somebody should keep going on ahead with Jared. We need to keep an eye on him, obviously. By that time, Jared just rounded a corner in front of him and was out of sight. Then when the group rounded that same corner, he was gone. They couldn't see him. That was the last time the group saw him. But it wasn't the last time he was seen. And it wasn't the last time he was heard, either. See, further on up the trail were a couple of fishermen, and they were packing up their equipment as they, they had been fishing in one spot and they were going to head to another place along the river. And then, as they're packing up their stuff and they're starting to walk, up comes this little precocious three-year-old, asking them all sorts of questions about wild animals in the woods and are there bears in the forest and all sorts of things that three-year-old boys find fascinating. The two fishermen and young Jared were walking along for a bit and the two fishermen are laughing and are having great fun with the little guys, he's asking all sorts of questions. Then, however, they came to a fork in the trail. One trail led down towards the river where these two fishermen were going. The other trail went up and deeper into the woods and deeper into this mountainous area. So at first, the two fishermen were thinking, hmm, maybe it's not okay to leave this young boy here by himself. But the thing was, they could hear. They could hear the group like within a hundred yards behind them. Like they were close enough that they couldn't see them, but they could hear all the talking back on the trail. So they kind of just assumed, oh, that's the group he's with, this young fellow's with, he'll be fine. They're, they're pretty close. Like we can hear them talking from here. We can hear their voices pretty clearly. So they didn't really think too much of it. They went their separate ways. And Jared went alone into those woods. The next thing is that members of the group, including Jared's sister, Jocelyn, they would report they heard a scream coming from up ahead on the trail. Now, it was odd. It wasn't like a long, drawn-out, you know, terrified, terrified scream of somebody being killed or something like that. It was more like they would say, it was more like a playful scream, as if, you know, somebody just jumped out at you, but in a joking kind of way, or they would describe it as if somebody had play, been playing tag, and, you know, oh, I got you, and, you know, he screamed, that kind of thing. Like, it wasn't, you know, a blood-curdling scream or anything like that at all. But it sounded like Jarrett. Then, silence. So the group kept walking up the trail, and then they really began to realize, where's Jared? They couldn't see him anywhere up ahead, and he's a three-year-old boy who seems like a lot of energy, but a three-year-old boy will also tire pretty quickly, and they still hadn't come across him. That's when they realized they did not know where he was, and that something was very wrong. They searched in the, the entire area for about an hour before two of the group, the, the two women, decided to go back to the resort and let the rest of the group, and Alan, of course, know that they couldn't find him. And now everybody was searching. Soon the Larimer County search and rescue would arrive, the sheriff's office, the sheriff's department would arrive. Everyone would want and began to scour the area and they found nothing. The authorities took over the search. They set up a command center, helicopters, dogs, people started coming from all over the state and beyond. And he had just vanished. It was, it was unexplainable. Like he was right there and then he wasn't. And there was nothing left behind from either where he went off the trail or if something happened to him or if he encountered somebody or something out there. They heard a scream, like maybe he had been attacked, but the scream didn't sound scared and there was no blood or clothing like left behind. And there was no other people there. They, they would say they didn't encounter any people along the trail either. The story this really reminds me of, and for those Redditors out there, you know, the stories of the staircases in the woods. Most of you probably have heard of it, but just to quickly recap, there was a post on the No Sleep subreddit the, the post was titled, 
I'm a search and rescue officer for the U.S. Forest Service. I have some stories to tell. The post goes on to say, I mean, it's, it's no sleep, so it's fake stories told as if they're real, but the story goes on to say about how, you know, they would encounter all these weird things out in the woods, like a young girl would climb a tree and she would never come back down. People seeing things, figures in the woods that nobody else could see. But one of the most infamous parts of the whole story goes like this. You can try asking about it with other SA or search and rescue officers, but even if they know what you're talking about, they probably won't say anything about it. We've been told not to talk about it by our superiors, and at this point we've all gotten so used to it that it doesn't even seem weird anymore. On just about every case when we're really far into the wilderness, I'm talking 30 or 40 miles, at some point we'll find a staircase in the middle of the woods. It's almost like if you took the stairs in your house, cut them out, and put them in the forest. I asked about it the first time I saw some, and the other officer just told me not to worry about it, that it was normal. Everyone I asked said the same thing. I wanted to go check them out, but I was told, very emphatically, that I should never go anywhere near them. The Jared Atadero story definitely makes me think of that because it's something so normal, so innocent, that really like gets like twisted on its head. Kids get lost in the woods all the time, but a three-year-old boy who's you know, less than 100 yards from 11 people, suddenly screams and then vanishes off the trail. But the story ain't over. And in fact, it just gets weirder. So the search was ongoing, and it was a bit of a mess at one point, even a helicopter crashing into the woods. No one was hurt, but it went on and on. Alan Atadero would say the, the Larimer County Sheriff's Office were less than helpful, and that the Sheriff's Department were even refusing help, you know, from, from people who really wanted it. You know, other search and rescue people were offering, and they were like, no, no, they... They turned down all sorts of resources that Alan Atadero wanted to try and help and find his son. As you can imagine, he was very pissed off at the Sheriff's Department, but, um, well, so it goes. It seems like there was a lot of, like, weird politics around this, as in, this is my jurisdiction. All that kind of shite when you thought, you know, you'd think a young child missing would kind of be a bit above, like, your priorities here, lads. Come on now. But rumors and stories would come out over time. For instance, right, in the Mesa Verde National Forest, which is another national forest in Colorado, but it's way away from where we are. It's like a nine hour drive to the southwest. A ranger would say, a park ranger had been in the forest. This is about a week after uh, Jared went missing. And he would say he'd been in the forest and he'd seen a man there with a young boy. And he would say this young boy kept trying to get away from the man and run towards the park ranger. But this man kept kind of grabbing the boy and bringing him back. And he said he was referring to the boy as Gerald is similar to Jared. The park ranger didn't really think this was too weird, or at least it didn't bother him too much, until later on he went home that night and he saw, turns on the box, and who does he see? Missing Jared Atadero, and he's like, that's the kid I seen. Honest to God, that's the kid I seen in the park. Now, it doesn't seem likely it was, probably just looked like him, because again, this is very, very far away, and I think probably Gerald, Jared, National Forest's probably just confused him, because it doesn't seem likely it was. But then again, if that was a separate boy, that's also kind of worrisome. It was then, three years later, that discoveries were made. But they were more thought-provoking than, than kind of honestly anything. On June 4th, 2003, long after the searches for Jared had finally wound down, two businessmen and hiking buddies, Gary and Rob, were off trail in the Big South Trail area. When? Just on a slope, 500 feet above the trail, they found a white shoe, white tennis shoe, just bang, sitting there in the undergrowth. Then soon they kept walking, they find another shoe. Then they find a jacket. Then they find some sweatpants. They quickly knew what they had found, and so they reported it to the authorities. They, these two lads, they full knew well about Jared Atadero. In fact, they said they'd just been talking about, oh, hey, a young kid went missing here a couple of years ago. And look what we found now. The authorities arrived and they sent pictures, they snapped pictures of everything they found, they sent it to Alan who, well, I mean, I wouldn't say he was jumping for joy, but, you know, at least they found kind of something. And in fact, in the following days, they would find the skull cap, so just the top part of the skull, and a tooth. They would never find any more, any more bones or any more anything related to this. But the weird thing that they did notice was that Jared's sweatpants that they had found there, they were inside out, which was struck them as very odd. They had finally found Jared, and DNA tests would confirm it was 100% him for sure, but this discovery just raised more questions. Now one theory about, okay, 
what do we think happened here? You know, and now do we found his remains or some of his remains? Okay, bing, got it. Mountain lion. He'd been walking up the trail or maybe it went off trail and a mountain lion spotted him, was looking to feed itself up for the winter. It nabbed him and that's why he was found where he was found and why this was all kind of spread around the place. Seems most likely. Except there was no blood on the clothing whatsoever. No blood. The pants were inside out, which, I mean, I imagine it'd probably be kind of hard for a lion to do that. And further testing of the clothes would reveal not one iota, not one trace of mountain lion hair anywhere on the clothing. And, you know, you'd probably think there'd be something. Another theory then was that maybe he'd been walking on the trail, he'd gone off trail, night had fell, Jared, young Jared, had started to develop hypothermia, paradoxical, un paradoxical undressing, he'd taken off his clothes, and then maybe he had been attacked by a lion. But then the clothes and the skull were found pretty close to each other again. And where the clothes were found would have been extremely difficult for a child to get to. This was actually in a very high part of the mountains, so high that the search and rescue didn't even search this area. They didn't search this part of the thing because they were like, there's no way a three-year-old boy could get up there. So unless he was attacked by a lion and then his clothes somehow followed him up of their own volition, or the lion brought up his clothes, that doesn't make kind of any sense really either. Another thing was that Alan would say Jared did not tie his shoes. And when they found his shoes, the laces were untied, which was perfectly normal. But if he had been attacked while wearing his shoes, as you can imagine he would be, there would be scuff marks and dirt on the shoes or the shoes would have fallen off. Yet the shoes were also found near where the rest of him was found. So him being kind of dragged up there also doesn't make any sense either. In fact, the shoes were in pretty good condition, especially for, you know, being out in the elements for three years, over three years by the time he was found. Although that's not exactly true either. The pathologist, when he was examining what they found of Jared Atadero, he would say, there's no way those shoes have been out in the elements for three years. They look, I mean, not brand new, but not weathered by three years of extreme Colorado winters. You know, they don't look like that at all. Those shoes look like they've been placed here recently enough. So then what that leads you with is somebody on somebody else was on the trail and kidnapped him. Killed him there and then took his clothing, took his shoes and returned years later to dump it in the same spot, which is pretty high into the mountains and into the wilderness, which doesn't make any sense. Barbman, like I said, this was so far that search and rescue didn't even go up that far. So assuming all of that, and then you also have to begin that with the assumption that there was somebody else out there and the group would report they didn't see anybody out there on the trail and you'd probably notice if there was some man running off with a child they would say they didn't see anybody else out there so that's quite a few assumptions to make in a story of how a young boy disappears isn't found for over three years and then is found in almost unexplainable circumstances yet again so who did he encounter out there who or what did he discover what did he find what secret out there discovered him a person, an opportunistic predator, man or, or otherwise. It's a story that leaves you with an eerie feeling, much like, as I said, those, you know, stairs in the woods. Because I don't know any explanation that's truly satisfying. It's a really weird story. One that leaves us, I think, with more questions than answers about what really happened to Jared Atadero. So, to begin, let's talk fire safety, kids, because I'm always on you about your safety. You know, with more than 8,000 wildfires across Canada every single year, the first and best line of defense are the hundreds of manned lookout towers across the country. There are 127 lookout towers measuring between 20 and 100 feet scattered across the province of Alberta alone. And out of all of these towers, the Athabasca Tower is more valuable than most of the towers. Given its proximity to the tiny ex-mining town of Hinton and the dense woodland, if a fire were allowed to get out of control, it's a serious possibility that the entire town would be consumed by flames. No bigger tragedy, if you ask me. So, you have to have people to watch in these fire towers, am I right? But it's, you know, not everybody can kind of stomach that, frankly, um, because it's probably not the easiest job to do. Let's be honest. It sounds great. Listen, count me in. Sign me up. Put me in, coach. But then to actually do that, you have to thrive in your own company and be able to maintain intense concentration for hours at a time. You know I'd be up there with my Steam Deck. I wouldn't be watching this. Seen one tree, you've seen them all. And I mean, a lot of people really think they are. They think to myself, Jay, I'd love to be up there. Out one with nature, you know? Away from civilization and all this shite. 
And then, you know, hey, listen, I played Firewatch. That's a good ass game. It's actually fitting because it's kind of for this story because it's quite creepy too. But, you know, after a couple of days, probably less than a week, you'd be running back to civilization, which I hate. Stockholm Syndrome. I mean, what exactly is it like day to day for these fire watchers in these lonely towers in the remotest parts of national parks? Pretty dull, lonely, and monotonous. If a fire does start, Look, it's well, they first have to figure out where exactly it is, what caused it, what keeps it going, and how is the fire behaving. They then have to radio the fire into a centralized dispatch center, which reports it to the responsible agency. It can be hard, and life. A lot of people describe the, from what I like reading into this and on Reddit and stuff, to people describing their experiences, it's almost like meditative to be a, a fire. Like the first couple of while, you kind of want to go crazy, and then it's like you fall into this trance, almost, of, of being looking out at the woods the entire time. No wonder people see creepy ass things out there because again, other people say they've seen some crazy stuff out there. B mysterious lights, watchers on distant hills, you know, shadow figures, dark figures watching them from the woods, all sorts of like, it's, I mean, it sounds like you know, tales to tell around a campfire at night, but a lot of people have reported seeing these things. I mean, let's be honest, most likely it's probably just people's minds playing tricks in them, but um, I mean, hey, listen, I don't trust my own mind to not play tricks on me. Firewatchers, though, didn't get much more suited to the job than our Stephanie Stewart. By 2006, 70-year-old Stephanie had been working for the Alberta provincial government as a fire lookout every summer for the last 18 years. The last 13 of those years spent living and working at the Athabasca Tower, a place where truly the views don't get much more stunning, and it's right by the Jasper National Park, surrounded by endless forests, beautiful, but it's also kind of something terrifying about how endless it is. So life for Stephanie, I mean, it wasn't all sun and roses. It's one that requires a lot of mental and physical discipline. It, it's quite a physical job. The higher up the tower, the better view it gives you. Some of these towers are 100 feet in the air. Some of the towers have staircases. This one didn't. It had a ladder you had to get up. A ladder you had to get up when you have to spend hours in the fire watchtower. Obviously, you have to spend your entire day there, so you have to climb up a ladder that's 100 feet in the air with a big heavy backpack filled with water and food and supplies and whatever you need up there. 70-year-old Stephanie did not let any of that stop her. She was a real go-getter. Stephanie was originally from Canmore, Alberta. Canmore, it's a small ex-coal mining town 50 miles from Calgary on the edge of the Banff National Park. Standing between 5'1 and 5'2 and weighing just 105 pounds, Stephanie was small but mighty. Her daughter Lori described her as, quote, a hell of a woman, very strong, very capable. Just seven months before our story begins, Stephanie, her daughter, and her son-in-law climbed Mount Kilimanjaro, if you can believe that, when Stephanie was 69 years old. Nice. Nice to climbing and also nice to, you know. So now each lookout tower has a cabin right, in these firewatch towers, and they're supposed to be, you know, self-sustaining, you stay out there for weeks at a time. Uh, in a lot of places in America, the cabin where, you know, the firewatch person would sleep and eat and do all their things, that would be actually in the tower, so it's all in, in one thing, kind of like what you, I guess, traditionally would imagine a, a firewatch tower to look like. But in Stephanie's case, the cabin was at the base of the tower, so she would have to climb up the tower every day, but, you know, she lived and slept in the cabin that was on the ground, and still in quite a you know, hilly part of the, of the forest. Now, Stephanie was known to be experienced and reliable. So when the 8 a.m. sit rep call didn't come in on the 26th of August, 2006, well, that struck the dispatch center as kind of odd, right? Stephanie, she always calls in. It's weird that she didn't, you know, hey, you know, they call in every morning, hey, I'm alive, uh, and that would be it. But she didn't call in that morning, so they were like, eh, let's just leave her for a bit. And then the guy in the dispatch center was like, oh, she's, look at the time. She still hasn't called in. You know, she's pretty strong and capable. She is also 70 years old. Maybe she fell. Maybe she had an accident. She is out there alone. I'll give her, maybe just, just give her a call. Ring, ring. Phone rang once. The phone rings twice. And then it's picked up. All right. But he didn't hear Stephanie's voice on the other end of the line. He just heard breathing. S somebody breathing. It was heavy breathing. It was deep breathing. It didn't sound like 105 pound, five foot one Stephanie at all. This sounded like a person, probably a man. And then the phone just goes dead. So the dispatch center is kind of thinking, oh, okay. Sounds like a beginning of a horror movie. I'm sure it's probably fine. Maybe she just tripped and fell and she's not able to talk. 
right now. So the guy from the dispatch center just goes, you know, I'll go and I'll drive over just to make sure everything's grand. So he drives over, drives, it takes him a while to get there, as you can imagine. He eventually rocks up to the Athabasca Tower. He sees her truck parked out front, sees everything, it looks fine. All right, I'm sure she's, she's probably in there, she's doing all right. He looks up into the tower, but can't see her in there. So he gets out of his truck and he walks over and he opens the door into the cabin where he expected to find her. And, but in there, there was nobody there. It was eerily quiet. It was, it wasn't quite, it was as if somebody had just been there. It wasn't cold yet. So he's kind of standing there and like looking around and he can hear this weird noise. So he walks in further and then in the kitchen, he sees a pot on the stove and then he can see, you know, mist coming out of it. So he goes, okay, it was actually boiling. The pot was still on the stove, boiling water. So seriously, somebody had just been here, turns it off. And then he looks around and is thinking, okay, now he's getting the heebie-jeebies. And then he got him even more when he saw that on the steps leading up to where the bedroom would be, smear of blood. Obviously, something was very wrong. And at 9 a.m., Stephanie was reported missing. Within hours, a huge search was organized with police and volunteers, many of whom knew Stephanie, combing a 2.4 mile square grid, including dense forests around the tower. They searched everywhere and they found nothing, no sign of Stephanie. Police then arrived at this point, you know, as, as a, you know, with the blood, you're thinking this is a crime scene possibly. They began to think maybe an animal, a bear or something like that had come in and attacked Stephanie or maybe, you know, she had tripped and fallen and was dazed and confused. I mean, the first area was kind of ruled out um, of it being a, a wild animal attack. If there, an animal had come in, you would know, probably. I mean, if a bear knocks on the door, let me in. I mean, there'd be, this place would be in a lot more of a mess and a lot more, you know, bloody if she had been attacked inside by a wild animal. So they kind of ruled that out fairly quickly. And then the next theory was, okay, there's blood on the stairs. Maybe she had, you know, gotten up, was making tea or coffee, boiling a pot of water. And then she, she was walking and she walked up the steps or down the steps, she trips and falls, bangs her noodle, so there's blood on the stairs. And then in some kind of dazed state, she just wanders out and into the forest and... Uh, but they, then again, a search found nothing of her and no trace of her having le left the place. And in fact, there was other signs in the cabin that there was more here than just an accident and something having gone wrong, wrong for our Stephanie Stewart. Several things were missing from the cabin, from the bedroom. There was two pillows were missing, the bed sheet was missing, and a Navajo like uh, spread, like a Navajo blanket was missing which are kind of, I mean, the first thing you're thinking of, what are you going to use them for? Maybe to wrap up a dead body and take it out somewhere. Anybody who can help, please. Sadly, Stewart remains missing. We continue to remain hopeful that uh, someone will come forward with information. The investigation was at a loss from the very beginning and there, there was no obvious suspects or motivation. I mean, this is in the remotest part of the remote. There should by all rights be nobody else here only Stephanie, yet she hadn't been alone in the most remotest of the remote. And Stephanie was a kind, well-liked and respected lady. Why the hell anyone would want to harm her was just unfathomable. It's possible the motive was robbery, though who's gonna go try and, oh hey, you know who I'll rob? A fire watch person. They, stacks of cash. Stephanie did have a gold watch. That was noted to be missing, but it was of, I mean, even though it was a gold watch, it was little value, it was sentimental to Stephanie. In fact, it's likely that Stephanie had it on her when she left or something took her. We know Stephanie last spoke to her daughter the night before at around 9 p.m. And according to her daughter, she seemed fine. No plans to leave the tower and certainly no indication of being in any sort of distress. So whatever happened, must have happened in, you know, those 10 or so hours from when she last spoke to her daughter till, you know, she missed the sit rep call the following morning. And the fact that there was a boiling pot of water would, would believe you would lead you to believe she had been up getting ready, maybe cooking breakfast or making tea or coffee, doing her thing. When? So what happened? Had she witnessed something? That was one theory is that maybe she'd been in there, um, drug dealers or something, because there was reportedly a bit of like drug trafficking activity in this area. Maybe she had saw something she wasn't meant to see, had encountered somebody she wasn't meant to encounter. They were worried she would radio it in and yada, yada, yada. Then she got, she got got or had it's just been a random attack. She had invited a stranger in or somebody had broken in in the morning. 
Again, though, this is way out in the woods. You would only want to be here if you wanted to be here, or if you were lost, and it's unlikely the first thing you're going to do if you get lost out in the woods is, hey, I'm going to murder somebody. Almost four years after Stephanie's disappearance, in July 2010, Lyle and Marie McCann disappeared while on a road trip in their RV from St. Albert, Alberta to Chilliwack, British Columbia. A journey that, non-stop, looking at 12 hours. But they were gonna stop. The couple, aged 77 and 78, had been due to pick up their daughter on the 10th of July. Instead, police reports responded to a suspicious fire at a lake, Camp Grand, about two hours west of St. Albert. That fire turned out to be a burning motorhome. It was the McCann's motorhome. They never made it to their daughter. But there was no sign of the couple, and their Hyundai Tucson was also missing. Or CMP could find only their burning motorhome, and not them. They had no idea. It was then that their daughter reported her missing. The RCMP put the missing persons report of, you know, the missing couple missing, and then finding their burning motorhome, and then a murder investigation began. Just try to manage and be there for each other and support one another. And, and I'm starting to realize that uh, this is going to be more of a marathon. Brett McCann has organized posters, searches, a reward, and now billboards. But he wonders if the key to finding his parents might be where the first signs of trouble were spotted. Minnow Lake, where their motorhome was engulfed in flames and their SUV went missing. It was two days after they left St. Albert for a road trip to B.C. on the first weekend in July. The motorhome being seen in the Minnow Lake campground on the 4th, burned on the 5th. It was not long after the discovery, however, that the RCMP reported that they wanted to speak with somebody. 38-year-old Travis Vader, he was a person of interest. The police believed that the McCanns had met with foul play. Now, Vader... I usually call people by their first names, but I mean, come on. He had a history. Length of that history. Woof. Vehicle theft, careless use, unauthorized possession of a firearm, arson, all that sort of thing. See, forensic evidence had dinged Travis Vader at the scene of the burning motorhome, so they believed he had been involved with them. Now, it's not believed they knew each other, but maybe he had tried to rob them and something, something. They did find the Hyundai Tucson then later on. It was found not far from where he actually lived. And then Travis Vader's sister would later say that after, you know, it's believed the fire, the McCann's motorhome went on fire, that he'd come to her and he'd been staying with her and that he looked, you know, upset, distraught. Perhaps how somebody might look if they were, I don't know, feeling guilty, perchance. He was officially made a suspect in the McCann's disappearance on the 31st of August 2010. Now, though, at this time, Travis Vader was actually arrested, but not on anything to do with McCann's disappearance and likely murder. He was arrested on outstanding warrants for some of those previous kind of, like, small-time gigs. But, you know, the police just wanted to have him in custody while they continued investigating what happened to this couple. Where were they? It wouldn't be until April 23rd, 2012, that Vader was finally formally charged in the McCann's disappearance. He was actually charged with two counts of first-degree murder, despite there being no bodies or physical confirmation of their deaths, which is, you know, a pretty rare thing, as it can be quite hard to make a homicide charge stick without a body. So, I hear, I hear you barking, big dog. What's all of this got to do with the crazy and creepy disappearance of Stephanie Stewart? Well, the thing about Travis Vader is that it's believed he was in the area when Stephanie Stewart disappeared. He, as we can see with the McCanns, he liked to target older folk, and usually the bodies were never found. And that pot of boiling water, the police would later come to believe that that wasn't there by Stephanie Stewart, you know, making tea or whatever. It's, they would start to believe that maybe this had been done as in somebody was trying to start a fire in the house, which, you know, was odd. I mean, there's easier ways to start a fire than just leave a pot of boiling water there, but I, dig I digress. But that's what he did to the McCanns with burning down their RV. There's too many similarities between his M.O., it's what he believed to have done with McCann's, to what could possibly have happened to Stephanie. You can't talk about the Stephanie Stewart case, I believe, without mentioning Travis Vader. Now, Vader's trial wouldn't officially begin until March 8, 2016. There had been some legal mumbo-jumbo going on for a, for a time, and the verdict came in September, with Travis Vader being found not guilty of first-degree murder of the McCann's, but guilty of second-degree murder. 
and Travis Vader got a life sentence for the murder of the two McCanns. Now, they have not been found to this day, and Travis in prison, you know, he, he denies any involvement in whatever happened to the McCanns, which we don't know. He also denies any involvement in the Stephanie Stewart case. Now, he is considered a suspect in the Stephanie Stewart disappearance. In fact, he's, he's like been the only named uh, suspect in what, whatever happened to her. Investigators haven't released much about why they believe Vader is a could be a person of interest, but they did say they know he was in the area at the time. And like the McCanns, they believe Stephanie was killed and her body dumped in the woods the same day she disappeared. This is a story uh, I actually covered on the podcast about a year and a half ago, and I wanted to go back to it with the video because, I mean, this is a story of a woman who was alone in her cabin in the woods. Most other stories of your know, people going missing and creepy disappearances out there can really be put down to misadventure, them getting lost, them just you know, falling into a cave, or none of those work with this one. This one was a deliberate kidnapping. As I said, I've been out in the woods a lot lately, and when I was thinking about this video and what stories I wanted to tell, well, I was thinking of what are the truly scariest and most disturbing National Park stories. And I could not talk about Stephanie Seward. So had Stephanie been in her cabin on the morning and heard a knock, knock, knocking on her door in the place, the one place you wouldn't expect to hear, to hear that? Or was there somebody else in the woods? Had somebody else came across her fire tower? The year was 1981, and over the summer, it was late July, the Aris family decided to get away from their home uh, of Saratoga, California, just outside of San Jose, and they were going to go to the Yosemite National Park. Woof. It was George Aris and his 14-year-old daughter, Stacy. And just after 3 p.m. on the afternoon of July 17th, they arrived at the Sunrise High Sierra Camp in Yosemite. See, George and his daughter Stacy, they had been traveling throughout Yosemite, you know, on horseback. They'd been there with about six other people. This is like one of those trips, you know, you book it, you go on a horse riding excursion, an overnight trip, you do like a big loop throughout the park. So they had arrived at this campsite with all of these cabins and they were gonna pop in for the night before they continued on like this little loop. But I mean, it's a huge ass area, so they'd be there busy and they were pretty tired. Now, this was a real bonding experience for George and Stacy. There was like the rest of the family, they'd been back home. It was just, you know, father, daughter, something they would look back fondly on in years to come. Well, I mean, they won't. They were fairly happy to have arrived to the, this campsite also. I mean, they were on horseback the whole time and it was a fairly mountainous, rough sort of area. So you're kind of pretty tired. Very happy to be there. So George and Stacy, they head into their cabin that they'd be staying at for the night. Stacy goes in, she showers, she changes, and then she's like, I'm gonna head out. She had her camera with her. She's gonna go around, snap some pictures, and she says to her dad, hey, George, dad, you know, you wanna come with me? I'm gonna go for a wander around. And George says, no, he's kind of exhausted from today. He's like, no, nah, I'm gonna just chill here. I'm gonna rest up. He does say to her though, change your sandals. She was wearing like sandals as she was walking out the door at that particular time. And he says, you know, change into a hiking boots. It's pretty rough around here. You might trip or fall or something if you're in sandals. So she does, and off she goes. She began walking, and as she did, she encountered another fella, an elder fella who's like in his 70s, name of Gerald. Now, Gerald had been part of their horse riding group, so, you know, they kind of sort of like knew each other or were acquaintances at least, and, you know, she starts yammering away to them, start yapping away to each other, and then she's like, I'm gonna head down towards the nearby lake, snap a few pics, and Gerald says, ah, sure, why not, I'll head with you. So they start walking for a bit, maybe, you know, 20 minutes or so, and they're yapping away to each other, and Gerald is like, I'm tired. I'm just gonna sit down on this rock. You head on. You head on by yourself. I'll just chill here for a bit. So she passed him. She kept on going down towards this lake, and then she, there's a, there was like this tree line right beside the lake, and then he she just disappears into the trees. And that was it. Didn't see her. So Gerald is sitting there, waiting for her to return, kind of just enjoying the beauty of Yosemite. And he's kind of like waiting, and he's waiting, and he's waiting, and then Phil hadn't come back, and Gerald is thinking, like, did she go off somewhere else? Do I, should I wait for her? Maybe I should head back. But then a group of three people come from the direction where Stacy had just gone. So Gerald says, oh, hey, how are you? Well, he probably didn't say how are you, but he's like, hey, you guys, um, did you see just a young teenage girl? Did you just pass by a teenage girl, perchance? And they say no. We didn't see anybody. We didn't pass by anybody. 
Stacy had been wearing white that day, so she would have been fairly visible, and she definitely went in the direction these people had just come from. So it was kind of worrisome. Gerald then goes back to the camp. He alerts everybody. He alerts everybody there, the park rangers, and of course, George, her father. Soon a search and rescue team arrived, and they started looking around the area, the lake, the woods, and the trees she had last been seen in. However, they didn't see her or any traces of her. Helicopters would soon get in on the action, and days would pass. Like I said, this was fairly high up, so at night, the temperatures would drop. Whoa, they'd take a nose dive, almost down to freezing. So it was like worrisome that they couldn't find her. She likely wouldn't last too long out here with the extremes it would get between day and night, and she had nothing with her. It didn't really make any sense. It felt like if she'd gone off trail, you know, they would have found her by now. Like in a lot of these dense forests, it's very easy to go off trail and suddenly you're gone missing, but this is high up in Yosemite. It's not like dense Appalachian woods. This is like, you know, conifers and rocks and stuff like that. But it's a very, very big area. So people started to think, well, maybe has something happened to her? Fell play. Like, had she been kidnapped and taken or something like that? Gerald was questioned, the last person to have seen her. Though, as I said, he was kind of an older fella. He, I mean, he was even too tired to keep going with her. So it seemed unlikely he had done anything to her. And also another witness would come forward saying they had seen Stacy like, walking away from him. So it's unlikely he ran after her or anything like that. She had gone off alone, though who knows if she remained alone. However, unlike in other stories, no one heard anything. No evidence left behind. And if she had been kidnapped... I mean, this isn't like Jared Atadero, where if a three-year-old is taken, you know, they would be easily taken. Stacy was, like, 14. Though slight, she would make a noise. She would be able to kind of... I mean, she would, she would fight back. She would scream or something. This isn't like a three-year-old boy. You can just, like, pick up and run off. Plus, this is in, like, the remotest of the remote of Yosemite. So that would mean somebody would have to carry her down a mountain without anybody seeing them. Or like at gunpoint or knife point. And again, nobody seen them. Nobody seen Stacy or with a weird man. And somebody would have seen something. The search actually went on for one week for Stacy. The only thing they ever found was the lens cap from her camera. That was it. No camera, no clothing, no none. The camera lens cap was actually found in the tree line Gerald said she had walked into. That, you know, she had near where she had last been seen, just like a little bit off the trail. So did something happen in that tree line, you know, that the lens fell off? Did the lens accidentally fall off? Maybe she didn't notice and kept going before then falling into a crevice or cave or something. Does the lens cap mean anything at all? Was it a signal from Stacy or irrelevant? So, did she run away? I mean, that was a theory. Um, it was reported she had some issues with her parents and with her siblings back home in Saratoga. In fact, that's probably likely why, you know, it had only been Stacy and her dad on this trip. Maybe it had been, you know, so they could talk and sort things out. It's reported that she had some issues. Maybe she had a boyfriend she had some issues with. But I mean, if you're going to run away, it's unlikely you would run away in the most remote place possible because you ain't going to get very far. So... Like, there's easier ways to run away than here. Plus, she, when she had left the cabin, she'd only been wearing sandals. Till George, her dad, said, Oh, you should put on your hiking boots. So, it's unlikely she was planning on running away in just her sandals without any supplies. What likely happened is she just wandered and wandered, just a bit further, just over the next hill. Until it got dark. Night began to fall, and she realized she was lost. Then she likely succumbed to the elements. I mean, the search was big, but the area is bigger. It's endless forest and woods and mountains and caves. It's beautiful, but very deadly. Scary to be sure. I think it's like inherent in all of us to be in love with, but also be creeped out by forests and woods. It's like something primal in us, like goes back to our caveman days. Like you love being out in, in nature. We all do, I do. You know, you love being out in the forests and the woods. It just feels calm, it feels good for the soul. You know, it feels like where you're supposed to be. And where you should be just naturally in nature, be one with be you know one with nature or, or whatever. But then at the same time, when you are back where you should be, back in nature, you also kind of realize that you're not top of the food chain anymore. And it is so easy to go missing in these places. I mean, so many of these stories, I guess, do come up with they do have weird and unexplainable facets to them, but at the same time, I think a lot of people just don't realize, as probably in the Stacey Arias cases, it's best demonstrated how easy it is to get lost out there. You don't think it happens till it happens. Like, just to briefly mention one other story which demonstrates this the best is the story of 66-year-old Geraldine Largay. She'd been on the Appalachian Trail doing a true hike, which is when you do one 
end of the trail to the other without stopping you do it all in one go. So she was like fairly, fairly well, like a fairly good hiker at her age to be able to do this. She had been on the trail alone, periodically meeting up with her husband who had been driving and meeting her at various places. So she'd been on the trail alone. She simply walked off the trail to go and use the restroom. Well, okay, not the restroom. To go and relieve herself in the woods. And she didn't make it. That was it. That's all it took. Just walking a few yards off into the deep dark woods and she was gone. This was on July 22nd, 2013. The next day, her husband, who had been meeting her periodically, he reported her missing. The search began and it was big. It was insanely big in this area. <laughs> Search dogs would come less than 100 yards from where she was. They did not find her when she was alive and she was there. She was looking for help. She had been texting her husband, please help me, let the police know. She, but you know, from where she was, her texts, you know, she had no signal. So he never actually got her texts. Rangers and aircraft, wardens and volunteers on foot spent a second straight day searching a roughly 25 square mile section of the Appalachian Trail. The searchers convinced the missing woman somehow veered off the trail. The Appalachian Trail has a pretty good communication system actually. Everybody talks to one another and uh, everybody knows that uh, she's missing and that nobody's seen her. She's not going to do anything stupid out on the trail. The missing woman's husband, George Largay, last saw his wife at a predetermined spot Sunday morning near Rangeley to drop off supplies. He had planned on meeting her here along Route 27 near Caravasset Valley Tuesday evening. George, confident his wife has the strength and wits to survive this. Jerry and I are both pretty spiritual people and I'm convinced that God's going to take care of her and he's got more work for her to do. It would later be determined that Geraldine survived for 26 days alone in the wild off the trail. She simply could not find it when she was only a football field away. And she kept a diary that entire time. In her final diary entry, which was written two weeks after she got lost, she wrote, quote, When you find my body, please call my husband, George, and my daughter, Carrie, and then their phone numbers. It will be the greatest kindness for them to know that I am dead and where you found me, no matter how many years from now. Please find it in your heart to mail the contents of this bag to one of them. There was then writing on one of the other pages, but it was illegible. Geraldine's body wouldn't be found for two years. So it is scarily easy. The woods are actually kind of terrifying. <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, for things to go wrong, even just by some, something as simple as that, just going to take a leak in the woods. Or though, then you have Stephanie's case and likely Jared's, where something goes wrong, not by your own volition, where you encounter something and you end up in circumstances which don't make any sense and are as, uh, I mean, I'm not sure if I would use the term unexplainable, but I can't find any good explanation for them. And it leaves you dumbfounded, confused, and scared. So when you're out in the woods, just, you know, watch your back and don't go off the trail. Thanks a million. Thank you so much for watching. Uh, it really means the absolute world to me that you're here watching this whole video. I hope you enjoyed this story. Um, it's been on my mind. A lot lately, you know, going out into national parks and forests and stuff like that, these stories have kept cropping up again and again, so I hope you enjoyed me telling them to you. Why not? <laughs> and um, here, listen, the next old video will be up um, next week, so please give it a go. Also, That Chapter podcast comes out every week, uh, every Monday, so give it a go. Some of the stories is just me, some of the stories I have guests on, kind of like alternating between me and then guests, so please uh, check that out wherever you get your podcasts. And I will see you real soon, but until then, please take care of each other and yourselves, especially if you're out in the woods. Because I love you. Mike out.